Bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Deeper Dive. Once again, we're so grateful to have you connected. This is the Mount Zion Bible study, and every single week we come in this place to grow together, to be all God has called us to be. I believe that our spiritual maturity is tied to our investment in the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of the Lord. That's why we're so committed to making certain that every single week you have the Word of God to build up your faith. Now, I'm excited. I really am. And I, I want you, while you're watching this, to make sure you connect with us here at Mount Zion Church. We love to know this is your first time or perhaps you you found us out here in the, in the Internet space. Listen, simply do this. Uh, follow me. Follow my wife. Follow our ministry. Uh, find out more about this ministry and make sure even on this page right now, on the Mount Zion YouTube page, that you like it, that you subscribe to it. We just want to partner with you to continue to provide relevant word for you as you go forward. I'm so thankful today as we are gearing up for this marvelous series. I'm excited about it. In this holiday season, we're calling it Friendsgiving. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But before we get into that, I want to give you an opportunity to sow into the kingdom of God. When we come together every single week, uh, we believe that our seed matters. We put our seed into the good ground. Mount Zion continues to be a blessing to the community worldwide. And we want you to help us do that. So why don't you do it right now? The information is right here at the bottom of the screen. Make certain that you sow in this Bible study. And we appreciate you so very, very much. Our prayer blessing over you now. Father, I thank you for every seed sower. Thank you for the abundance that you promise in your word. And I give you glory and praise. It's already done. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, I'm really excited because this series, Friends Giving, it's so important. There are a lot of people who have coined this term because it really helps us understand the importance of our relationships. And our vertical relationships matter and our horizontal relationships matter. And I really believe in this Thanksgiving season, we have to begin to focus on what it means to be in real relationship with God. What does it really mean uh, to really anchor in on three particular areas, faith, hope, Love. What does that mean? This entire series, we're going to focus in on those three areas. I've asked associate pastors of our church to share a word with you in these particular areas. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your notepad. I want you to prepare even the app to make sure you follow us because this is going to be a blessing. And this very first teaching today, Pastor Brian Bradshaw is going to come. He's going to speak to us about faith. And how does faith present itself in our relationship with God and even in our relationship with others? In this holiday season, I promise you, it's so important that we understand the power of faith. You're getting ready to be blessed. Pastor Bradshaw, bring this word. Let's hear what God will say to us now. Well, thank you so much, Bishop. And thank you for tuning in to this Deeper Dive series on Friendsgiving. I'm so excited to share with you the Word of God. And today, we're talking about faith and friendships. So what I want you to do, as Bishop said, I want you to get your notepad. I want you to get your phone, a napkin, something to write on, because we're going to take a deep dive into the Word of God for both faith and friendship. Are you ready? Let's jump into it right now. Our anchoring scripture for today comes from Proverbs 17 and 17. And it reads, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. You know, when we think about the scripture and think about faith and friendships and community, we realize that from the very beginning of time, we see in the creation story in Genesis that God was very intentional and strategic to not have man navigate through life alone. And as a result, we see this in Genesis 1, verse 26, that says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. But then he says, let them, let them have dominion over the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The question becomes, who is the them? Well, we know that that is both male and female. According to Genesis 1 and 27, we see that God creates both male and female in the persons of Adam and Eve. And so we see from the onset that God desires for man not only to be in relationship with someone, but to also not do life alone. 
And throughout all of scripture, we have many examples of community and the necessity of it. And this brings us to our anchoring scripture today for our study, as this verse really speaks to us about the heart of friendship, about what it means to be a friend and why it matters, not just in our daily lives, but also in our spiritual journey. So when we think about friendship, we often envision moments of laughter, shared experiences, unquestionable support, a safe space in someone who is a confidant, right? But the wisdom of this Proverbs and this scripture encapsulates the very essence of friendships and reminds us that true friendships extend well beyond just the good times. It's a relationship that endures through every season of life. In fact, there's a quote that says, friendship is not about who you've known the longest, but it's about who walked into your life, stayed and proved it. I want you to just take a moment and think about that quote right there. Can you think about the people in your life right now, the friends in your life who may have walked into your life? They've been there from the very beginning And they've proved it time and time again. And we ought to just give God glory for having some consistent friends and people in our lives. You know, in the biblical context, a friend isn't merely an acquaintance. But a friend, according to Proverbs, is someone who loves at all times. In the Greek, the word love is philia, which is a form of love that encourages goodwill, friendship, and affection. Now watch this. Unlike the other types of love, such as eros and agape, philia places an emphasis on shared values and and common goals to maintain its strength. So this is a love, watch this, that does not waver in the face of challenges, disagreements, or trials. It's a love that remains steady when circumstances shift and it stands as a constant source of support as well as encouragement. And so when you think about that type of love, that brotherly love, that love that binds friendships together and relationships together, this is why it's so important that before you call anyone a friend and you give anyone that title in your life, you have to, watch this, decide on the right friends. I want you to type that in the chat. I must decide on the right friends. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 13 and 20, he who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Wow, that says a lot right there. Now watch this. Now, who you choose to call friend should never be taken lightly. You have to understand that you must walk in wisdom and take your time when choosing friends. Just because they smile in your face, appear to be nice, or call you bro and sis, or always comment on your social media posts, does not mean they deserve the title of friend. Because the reality of it is, it is often said that you are the sum total of the five people you hang around. Think about the five people who are closest to you. And if you had to describe yourself and your friends in one word, write down what that word would be. You know, the Bible says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. So it's very important that before you call someone a friend, you must observe them as an acquaintance in seasons of happiness, of frustration, of plenty, of lack, of challenges, of loss, of gain, of peace, of stagnation, of progression. In many seasons, you must observe them before you call them friend. Because who you connect with is a representation to some degree of who you are, and even, watch this, of what you have built or what you are building. What took you years to build can be torn down in a matter of seconds with the wrong people in your circle. And we have seen this time and time again, play out time and time again in the public arena where friends can impact not only a person, but can have either a positive or negative impact on other relationships, businesses, and even your destiny. 
you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So what you must do before you make a decision to give someone that title of friend, you must determine the why behind the desire to connect. So you have to spend time getting to know that person to discern their motives. One of the things I'm very cognizant of is who I connect with. With people, when people desire to connect with me on a friend level or any level, before I allow them to come into that space, I spend a considerable amount of time of not only listening to what they're saying, but observing how they move. Who they are connected to, because their associations can tell you everything you need to know. So not only do I listen to what they what they say, but I observe how they move because their associations and how they interact in various spaces can tell you everything that they're not saying to you. So you want to be cognizant not only to listen to what a person is saying, but to observe them in various spaces. Because the reality of it is you need to know what are they doing in their life. So you have to listen to what they say and how they move. What are they doing with their life? How are they in various seasons when things change in their lives? That will tell you the type of person that they are. And we see, you know, great examples of faithful and covenantal relationships and friendships in the Bible. Let's do a case study. We see this with David and Jonathan. Now, this unfolds in 1 Samuel chapters 18 through 20. I encourage you to go back and read it when you have time. But as an overview, David and Jonathan were both from very different backgrounds, yet their friendship trans transcended societal norms and expectations. We know David. David was a young shepherd, and Jonathan was the king's son, and they both formed a unique bond. The friendship was solidified by, watch this, unwavering loyalty, deep trust, and mutual support. You know, Jonathan was the king's son, and Jonathan recognized David's God-given talents and qualities. But watch this. Instead of feeling threatened by David's rising popularity and the anointing on his life, he chose to befriend him. Why? Because true friends are never jealous of you. You know, a litmus test of a true friend is if they can embrace, celebrate, and cover your success and anointing. I'll let that sit for a minute. Think about the people in your life. Can they embrace, celebrate, and cover the trajectory that you're on, the success that you have, and the anointing that's on your life? And when you take another, a deeper dive in 1 Samuel 18, we read about how in the face of King Saul's jealousy and attempts to harm David, watch this, that Jonathan stood by David and risked his life against his own father to protect him. But we also see that David also reciprocated this loyalty. He honored his friendship with Jonathan, Jonathan and displayed it even during challenging times. Their friendship, watch this, was not fair weather. It remained steadfast in the face of adversity as well as trials. Here's the next point. Friendships must yield reciprocity. I want you to write that down and do an assessment of all of those who you call friend and really ask yourself, is there reciprocity in this relationship? Because the reality of it is, I want you to always remember this. If a person takes more than they give, the giver and the relationship will eventually become depleted. I'm going to say that again. Always remember, if a person takes more than they give, the giver and the relationship will become depleted. But not only that, do you have to decide on the right friends, but then you have to determine the level of access. You must understand that those whom you give access to in your life have a direct impact on your life as well as your spiritual journey. 
This is why you must carefully choose those whom you do life with and the type of access that person has to you. You have to be very careful. I remember when I was growing up, I lived across the street uh, from who's still now my best friend and his sister. Um, and my, my parents and their parents are still close to this day. And when we were born, our parents connected us uh, as we got older to develop a friendship. And I'm still friends with both of them, my best friend and his sister. We're still close to this day. And we developed a bond. And we were the two houses that had all of the toys, right? We had the basketball goal. We had all of the, the, the games. We had all of the video games, the consoles. We had the Legos. We had the, the toys, the trucks. We had all of the toys that the kids down the street wanted. So as a consequence, because of our relationship, I had access into their house and they had access into my house. And what would happen is uh, his parents at times and my parents at times would say, now, Brian can come in the house and Brian can even go in the backyard. But the kids from down the street, they can only come in the front yard. And my parents would say the same. Now, uh, Brian, your friends, they can come in the house and they can go in the backyard and y'all can play and have at it because we had a relationship his parents knew me and my parents, and there was a level of trust. And the question becomes, who has access and what level of access do you give people in your life? The reality of it is there are some people who should only have front yard access in your life. But there, are, there should be a very select few of people who should be able to come in the house of your life and even in the backyard of your life. And so you want to be clear and take an evaluation on who has access to your life. Just like there were the kids down the street who really meant us no harm. We would always uh, get into fights with the kids down the street. It would be the three of us versus them, right? Because there was a level of jealousy because of what we had. We were just kids having fun, enjoying what our parents uh, had bought us and doing what kids do. You have to be careful of the level of access you give people because you never know what their motive is. Reality of it is, when we look at the friendship of David and Jonathan, it was covenantal. And you must be clear on the type of friendships that you have. Is it a covenant friendship? Is it a lifelong friendship? Is it a seasonal friendship? Is it a professional friendship? The type of relationship that you have and friendship that you have should determine the type and the level of access you give to people. But not only should you determine the level of access and the type of access, but watch this. You must have cultivating friendships. Woo. Now, this is a big one, cultivating friendships. The Bible says in Galatians 6 and 2, bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Let's look at the first clause, the first portion of the scripture. Bear another's burdens. When you have real friends in your life, they don't just sit back on the outskirts of your life watching you navigate through life. But they come alongside of you and walk with you, encouraging you, covering you, and looking out for you and your best interests. Watch this. And being present. They are present with you in every season of your life. Let's do a case study. Let's take a case study. All right. Y'all with me? Let's do a case study on the paralytic healed. Let's go to Mark chapter two and let's look at verses two through 11. Let's do a case study. The Bible says immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them not even the door. And he preached, he being Jesus, preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. 
when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone, they questioned. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to this paralytic, your sins are forgiven or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Then the Bible says that immediately he rose, arose, took up his bed and went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified by God saying, we never saw anything like this. Did you catch what happened? Did you really catch that? This powerful story shines the spotlight on the power of the faith of the paralytic's friends. We see that this man's friends were adamant to bring him to Jesus so that he could heal their friend. So when they encountered the crowded house, they did not make excuses. They did not give up. They did not just say, oh, I'm praying for you and go on about their day. But they got creative and climbed up on top of the roof and lowered their friend down to Jesus as he was in the house teaching because they were committed to ensuring that their friend was a recipient of a miracle. Whew. I don't know about you, but that part just blessed me right there. And so when we look at this, watch this, Jesus being moved by the faith and commitment of the man's friends he stopped and not only forgave the man's sins, but he healed his inability to walk. So Jesus forgives and heals a man because of his friend's faith. What are you saying, Pastor Bradshaw? Long story short, your friends, you need friends who will put you in Jesus's way to get you what you need. I'm going to say that one more time. You need friends who will put you in Jesus's way to get you what you need. I want you to take an assessment of your friends. Are your friends pushing you closer towards what you're believing God for? Are they encouraging you in your faith? Are they uh, providing uh, scripture and covering and prayer for you? Are they providing support for you? Are they coming alongside of you to say you're not in this alone? A quote says, there's a quote that says, a real friend is one who walked in with and with you and when everyone else walked past you. Let me say it one more time. A real friend is one who walked in and with you when everyone else walked past you. That was the story of this para paralytic, that everyone was walking past him, looking at him, judging him, talking about him. But there were four friends who said, we're going to come alongside you because we want to see you better. Real friends want to see you be the best version of yourself. Real friends will put you in spaces where they know Jesus is. They will put you on in spaces where your faith can be increased. Your faith can be proven. Your faith can be increased in various areas. And I thank God that we have people in our lives, and I pray that you do too, that will put you in the way of Jesus to get you what you need. But watch this. Not only do you have to have cultivating relationships, you must have cultivating relationships. But watch this. You have to learn how to manage friendship seasons. That's very big for us. Not only do you have to have these cultivating relationships, but it's also important that you understand that friendships have seasons. And it's important to know how to manage those seasons and steward those relationships. Challenges in friendships, uh, differing in values, conflicts, and expectations must be stewarded with love, 
patience, understanding, and maturity, right? So when managing challenging times and friendships, you must understand that disagreements should never lead to disrespect, even if you have to go in different directions. I don't know about you, but I know that there are some people uh, that I've had in my life previously where there have been some challenging times and friendships and there have been disagreements and we have recognized that the relationship and the friendship had come for a season. And we had recognized that there was a time and a space and a purpose that that friendship served and it was time to go separate ways. But just because we ended up going separate ways does not mean that we lost respect for one another because we did not see eye to eye. And I believe that many relationships have to reach a level of maturity to where you make a decision on doing what's in the best interest of you as an individual, but also what's it for what's in the best interest of the relationship. Let's look at this a little deeper. Let's take a deep dive in the case study of Paul and Barnabas. Let's go to Acts chapter 15. Let's look at verses 36 through 41. Bible says, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. Then the contention, the Bible says, became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. <clears throat> Let's look at this. On their first missionary journey, John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, according to Colossians 4 and 10, accompanied them. Watch this. But along the way, however, John Mark decided to return to his home in Jerusalem, according to Acts 13 and 13. Barnabas accompanied them But along the way, however, John Mark decided to return home to his home in Jerusalem. Now, the reason why he departed is really not specified. But here is the point. Let's take a deeper dive into this case study. Now, later, when a second visit was planned, Barnabas proposed of taking Mark as a helper. But Paul resisted the idea. And as a result, a strong disagreement developed between Paul and Barnabas. So it was so contentious that they could not reach an agreement so that they ended up splitting up. The tension between the two, watch this, was a personal dispute based upon a judgment call. Now, neither Paul nor Barnabas allowed the disagreement to distract them from their respective efforts of spreading the gospel. Can I tell you something? In every relationship, there will be times where there is a disagreement in matters of opinion, but that should not prevent you from focusing on your purpose or continuing with your life. This does not exempt you from the feelings of the severed relationship, but you cannot allow it to immobilize you. Can I tell you something? Disassociation does not have to dismantle mutual love and respect. The disagreement and parting of ways did not permanently disrupt the love and respect that Paul and Barnabas had for one another. Paul, we would see in scripture, would later affectionately uh, mention Barnabas as being worthy of monetary support in his work of proclaiming the gospel. And we see this in 1 Corinthians uh, 9 and 6. The Bible says, uh, and this is Paul speaking, My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and to drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife 
as do the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit. Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. We see Paul speaking well of Barnabas, despite them parting ways later on. But then in Second Timothy four and eleven, the Bible says, and this is Paul again, be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has spoke forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed from Thessalonica. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful for me in ministry. Can I tell you something? Just because we don't talk every day, you have to get to this point in your life. Just because you may not talk to someone every day or your life has taken uh, you both in two different directions does not mean that any love or respect has to be lost. Some of the best friends you will have are those whom you may have gone a time without talking to. You may have gone a couple of months without talking to. But when you come back together, you pick back up where you left off or even relationships that have gone have gone in their different direction in their perspective directions, even in other spaces where the other person is not present. You still speak well of that person because this association does not have to dismantle mutual love and respect for one another. You have friends like that, friends that you go You've gone your separate ways. Life has taken you on different trajectories, but you may still come in contact uh, here and there. I know I do. But you know what? When we get together, it could be two months. It could be three months. It could be six months. But whenever we connect and we get together, we pick right back up where we left off. Those are the type of people that you need in your life. But let's check this out. Let's look at real quick the characteristics of true friends. Can I give you some characteristics of what you should be looking at? This is friends giving. So let me show you what friends should be giving in a friendship. They should be giving consistency, reciprocity. You can determine the strength and the proximity of friendship by the poor in exchange. If they are consistently, if you are the one consistently pouring, uh, if you are the consist, only one consistently and constantly sharing, you may need to Reevaluate that relationship. Consistency, reciprocity, accountability, vulnerability, transparency, grace, understanding. Is there a covering? Do your friends cover you? Do your friends have compassion? Are they loyal? Do they bring balance in your life? Are they fun to be around? Life giving and not life draining. It has to be a healthy balance, uh, encouraging, but a few other characteristics, those who have integrity, they're empathetic, they're non-judgmental, and they are supportive. Can I tell you something about friends who are supportive, having people who are supportive. You don't need people in your life who are trying to compete with you or one up you. You need people in your life that can handle the trajectory of your life, the anointing, the success, all of the great things that you have happening in your life. You need people who will come alongside of you and be your biggest cheerleader and support. Let me tell you something. I recognize that when it comes to friendships and relationships, the reality of it is that some of you are empty because of how much you have given and all that you have been through. I want you to know that there is a friend who sticks closer than any brother. That when you look at faith in friendships and you, re you really take an assessment of all of the friends in your life, some of you will come to the stark reality that you're empty, you're depleted because you have been the one that's been giving and giving and giving. If you're like me, uh, there was a time where I took an evaluation of all of the people that were connected to me. And I stopped reaching out to see if they would connect with me, if they would reach out to me. And the reality of it is, I came to the realization there are some people 
from over a year and a half ago that I took that same assessment, I have not heard from today. The reality of it is sometimes friendships hurt. And you've been pouring into people, you've been giving, and it takes, it has taken a lot out of you. And it takes a lot out of you when you've been the only one pouring out. And you rarely get poured into because you are the strong friend and you have the big heart. But again, I know the best friend you could ever have, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so to any of you that are empty, you have, you're, you're almost on E. You're empty. Your cup is, doesn't have much in it. I've come to tell you that today in this moment, I'm asking our Lord and Savior to begin to pour back into you, to fill that cup. Would you receive that now? Bible says as you're receiving that, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than any brother. I want you to allow the friend that sticks closer to any brother to fill your cup right now. I believe right now that Jesus is filling your cup. Some of you have been empty. And we thank God for the best friend that any of us could ever have. John 15 and 13 says, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. My brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, he's the best friend that you could ever have. And if you want to make a decision today, if you want him to pour back into you as you see that water filling that cup, that cup, this cup right here, this cup is you. And look, and that's Jesus filling you up again right now. I want you to make a decision to give your life to Christ today. Someone else, I want you to make a decision right now to recommit your life to Christ right now. Let him fill you up and let him fill you until you overflow. What I want you to do, the word salvation is right there on your screen. I want you to text that word right now. Text that word salvation to 78228. I want you to do it now. We're going to connect with you because there's going to be a, a party when you text that number. Our team is going to rally around you, and we're going to be sure that we facilitate introducing you in, into the best friend that you could ever have, and his name is Jesus. I want to thank you for tuning in to the first installment series of this series, Friendsgiving on Faith and Friendships. I pray that you have been blessed today. I want you to send this, share this with somebody who needs this word on today on faith and friendships. I thank God for you. May God bless you. May God keep you. It is.